Hi, everybody. This is Larry Ferlazzo and Katie Helsinevsky. I hope you can hear us or see us, and ideally both. Um, maybe you can indicate on the in the comments if you can indeed hear us. Uh, we're here in Katie's classroom, uh, and we're here to talk about English language learners. Uh, then Katie and I have written three books. Here's our first one. <laughs> <laughs> this is our second one. And this is one that just came out this week. Woohoo! Hot off the presses. Uh, first, we thought we'd introduce ourselves. Uh, I'm Larry Ferlazzo, and I have been teaching English language learners and IB theory of knowledge classes, as well as mainstream students for the past 15 years at Luther Burbank High School in Sacramento. Uh, and prior to that, I was a community organizer for 19 years. I've written nine education-related books and do an Ed Week teacher column, teacher advice column, and write about ELLs for the New York Times. And I'm Katie Holsepneski. I've been teaching in Sacramento in the same district as Larry for over 20 years. Um, I'm currently teaching middle school, ELA and ELD. And yeah, in my spare time, I write books with Larry. Yeah, when I can pressure her and make her feel guilty about it. And Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, so today, we're going to cover what we think are three critical elements of ELL instruction. And obviously, there are many others. And we are human PowerPoints today, okay? <laughs> High tech. <laughs> One is differentiation. The second is student motivation. And the third is affirming error correction. And we'll be talking about a lot of online resources, and you can find a link to them on my blog. If you just search Larry Ferlazzo on the web, my blog will come up. And it's actually, I think, the second or third post down. However, uh, EduBlogs, which is the premier blogging service for educators internationally and nationally, is unfortunately down went down this afternoon, so it won't be, and it's still down. I'm sure it'll be up back up before the end of the evening. But if you try to go there now, you won't be able to find it. Uh, but I think the title of the blog post is Online uh, English Language Learner Resources, and it'll list, it'll lead you to a list of those resources as well as uh, some videos. I've been doing some professional development at my school, and we've had multiple student panels where English language learners have been sharing what they think uh, teachers have done that have been helpful to them and what the teachers have done that have not been helpful to them. So you might find that interesting. And so two things that we wanted to share with you. Oh, the light goes off in my classroom every few minutes. <laughs> This is reality here, folks, so I will need to stand and turn it back on. <laughs> we wanted to share two things that really guide our teaching of ELLs, and the first is we look at them through a lens of assets and not deficits, because they bring so many rich experiences to our classroom, they speak multiple languages, they possess numerous skills and abilities, and we want to encourage them to continue to develop all of these skills while they're learning English. Also, researchers have found that ELLs tend to feel more strongly about having a growth mindset because they can see the, the application. They can almost immediately apply what they are learning. They are also, they tend to be more creative because of their exposure to so many different experiences. And just like most of our English-only students, they already demonstrate a lot of perseverance and grit. Um, and they just need to be encouraged to apply that in an academic setting. The other, th the other thing that guides our teaching is the idea that good teaching for ELLs is good 
for everyone. And so we use these same techniques in our mainstream classes. Larry teaches an IB class, and he uses it in that class because these strategies work. Although sometimes our English-only students tell us to that, that we can speak a little faster <laughs> and not use gestures. Um, before we continue, we should mention that if you have comments or questions, uh, agree or disagree with us, please share it in the comments section. And we will look forward to seeing those and responding to some. Uh, so just wanted to mention that. I mean, hopefully we'll see it on our screen. Right. <laughs> yes. OK. There we are. Great. So. We're going to talk a little about differentiation. And it's important to keep in mind that uh, treating students equally does not necessarily mean we're treating them fairly. Uh, and in my experience, students get that pretty well, and most teachers do. But, uh, you know, for example, at least in my classes, students know that if I let some students listen, you know, a student listen to music, while they're reading, students, and I ask other students not do that, students know that, know that if I don't let that student read it, you know, uh, listen to music, we bouncing off the walls, right? I mean, so it's, you know, we need to look at that idea that uh, all of our students have different challenges and needs, and we need to acknowledge that in our practice. So let's talk about some ways that we can differentiate for ELLs and for all of our students, since as Katie mentioned, good teaching for ELLs is good teaching for everybody. One is wait time. Researchers have found that the, in the typical classroom in the United States, the wait time between when a teacher asks students for a, asks them a question and when they expect a response is one second. So uh, obviously for ELLs, that's not gonna work too well if the question is in, Spanish, in, in English. And for most students, it's not gonna work very well. Researchers have also found that if you extend that time to th between three and five seconds, the quality of the response is much, much higher. And you know, oftentimes what I'll do is I'll tell students, okay, I'm gonna ask you a question, but I don't want anybody to answer it. I want you to think about it first. Uh, oftentimes doing think, pair, share. And that feeds into the Common Core, talks a lot about collaboration as opposed to cooperative learning. And in collaboration, the idea is a student doing some work, whether it's thinking, whether it's writing, and then sharing with someone else, getting feedback, and then going back and making their thinking and their work better. So this idea of wait time feeds into that. Uh, another way to differentiate is the fancy word or fancy phrase of non-linguistic clues. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I just cover my face. Yeah, it's fine. I'm told I have a good voice for radio. <laughs> anyway, uh, and I have to excuse, I, I'm, I'm, I've got a cold, so uh, my radio voice isn't even that good today. Uh, gestures, pictures, graphic organizers, fairly standard stuff that we all need to use with our English proficient students as well. Slide, uh, our next slide, or our next sign, is word walls. Uh, and I don't know about you, but in the past, sometimes I just put a bunch of words up there, you know, in, in some kind of decorative, decorative way as opposed to having images associated with them, having them in categories. It doesn't mean I've got to do the uh, images. It doesn't even mean I have to come up with the categories. Even better, in an interactive word wall, as Valentina Gonzalez, who's an ELL teacher in Texas, uh, I think she's doing a workshop on, on that soon, talks about interactive word walls. And the idea is, uh, have it up there so make it more accessible to students. It's not just decoration. 
Another way to differentiate instruction is a tried and true strategy in bilingual education called uh, preview, view, and review. And that is done which the idea is it's the lesson is previewed in the student's home language. The lesson is then viewed, done in uh, English, and then reviewed in the student's home language. That, uh, I mean, you can obviously do that in a bilingual classroom. In a mainstream classroom, it's more complicated, but the version that we use is that there are tons of free resources online in our students' home languages. And there's a, um, links to all those on, on my blog. So for example, if I'm teaching my ELL US history class, I'll often uh, print out a copy uh, from a textbook. It's not our textbook that we're using, but it's about the same era uh, in Spanish or Arabic or um, you know Vietnamese and give it to the student a week ahead of time uh, and uh, for the student to, re to, to review. Uh, so it's a great resource for that. And some of you are familiar with BrainPop, which has uh, similar resources, has great animated videos in English and in Spanish, uh, and it costs. Uh, I know over the years I've paid for uh, a teacher subscription. I think it's worth it. But also it's another way for students to help activate and develop the prior knowledge that they need to access the lessons we want to teach. Uh, the next one is same text, different levels. Again, there's zillions, I mean literally thousands, if not tens of thousands of articles uh, online in different sites that are divided into different lexile levels, the text complexity levels. So in a mainstream classroom, or even in an ELL classroom, giving students uh, different levels of the same text. And there are sites, free sites like Rewordify, that allow you to uh, copy and paste your own text, and they will simplify it. And they do a fairly decent job of it. Our English department was, was playing around with it last month, and uh, we were impressed with what they did with Edgar Allan Poe's poem, The Raven. Collaborative learning. Uh, you know, I, I talked a little bit about collaboration earlier, and this is just simply getting a uh, getting ELL students in a small group with where there's one student who wants to help them doesn't have to doesn't even have to speak their uh, home language but just wants to help and plenty of research shows that the tutors are uh, gain as much benefit if not more than their two T's academically. And this idea of collaborative learning leads us to the jigsaw. Many of us are probably familiar with that. Uh, and it's perfect for ELLs, uh, where whether you are, uh, you have a group studying, doing a biography of Abraham Lincoln, and you give your least English proficient students, their job is to identify the, the personal milestones of Lincoln, when he was born, when he got married, how many kids he had, when he died. And more English proficient students, what are the, the accomplishments or the challenges that he faced? Or with a text, you can uh, give the beginning ELLs a paragraph, more proficient ELLs a page. And John Hattie, who's sort of the, 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 the big international data education guru these days, highlights Jigsaw as the instructional strategy that basically knocks everything is off the charts in terms of higher level thinking uh, and literacy instruction. And uh, so it's a, great, it's a great tool. Next one, sentence starters, right? I agree because, I disagree because, etc. Having those on the wall are great or in front of students. And then writing frames, which are basically extended sentence structures. Uh, there's lots of different strategies for that in, our, in the blog post. There are links to many downloadable templates. ABC, answer the question, back it up, make a comment. 
Uh, I say, uh, they say, I say, why I say it. They're, they're, they're great. And then writing structures, which are a little different. So writing frames are basically expanded sentence starters. Writing structures, so writing frames is fill in the blank. Writing structures tells you what goes where. They'll say hook, thesis statement, but you've got to, the writer and the student has to come up with it. So in some of my classes, I'll give some students uh, writing frames and some students writing structures. Katie's jumping up and down <laughs> trying to make the lights go on. So, so that is uh, a short list of differentiation and st uh, strategies. Mm -hmm. And now Katie is going to talk about everybody's favorite subject, grading. Grading. So in terms of uh, differentiated grading for ELLs, our district and our schools don't have a set policy, even our state doesn't. Uh, Larry and I recently wrote an article that is a, going to be available on the blog, which shares our opinions about grading. Um, and, you know, federal civil rights guidelines say that if a beginning student uh, enters as a ninth grader, it's up to the school to create the conditions for that student to graduate in four years. And we need to keep in mind the research shows that it takes four to seven years to learn academic English. And if it is on the teacher to make this content and assessment accessible to ELLs, that can be a, a big challenge. Um, and so in theory, we're supposed to be able to have them graduate in four years and have it be accessible. However, we recognize that some teachers either don't know how to do that or aren't going to do it because of time or other issues. And our question is, if you're not going to make the content and the assessments accessible, how can you ethically not differentiate your grading. So you can see our article just for more on that. And just a few other things to keep in mind in terms of differentiation. Of course, talking slowly. Uh, Larry needs to be quicker, <laughs> quicker on the... <laughs> Maybe not a very good human PowerPoint. Here. Close. Caption videos, we always make sure those are on. And also, um, if we're watching a video like on YouTube, setting it to a slower speed can be helpful. Providing written and verbal directions for students. Checking for understanding beyond uh, asking, does everybody understand? And looking out to see everyone nodding, uh, but actually having students explain to a partner or write down what they've learned as an exit ticket. Um, modeling, of course. So modeling what we expect students to produce, but also the steps for how to get there. And pre-teaching academic vocabulary, we actually have an example here. So maybe we can get it a little bit closer, but something like this where students are looking at the academic vocabulary, they can write the meaning in their own words, they can do a translation with related words, uh, and they can draw a picture to show their understanding. And like Larry was talking about earlier, uh, using peer tutors and of course, it's great if they speak the student's home language, but we have a lot of students who are English only or speak a different language from the student who needs help and there's would love to help and it's good for them. Like Larry said, it's good for the tutor and the 2T. Student motivation, our next primary topic. And and thanks, Jen. 
Oh, okay. So that's great strategy. Okay. <laughs> you have good judgment, Jen. Okay. Uh, so in student motivation, uh, there's this concept called self-determination theory that has several components in how to help students develop intrinsic motivation, how to create those conditions. And one is autonomy. Does a student have some control over what is studied, what is done, and how it's done? So there are three ways, three primary ways for to help develop autonomy. One is uh, procedural. I'm sorry, one is like organization. So for example, where do you want to sit? All right, that's an example of organizational autonomy. Procedural uh, autonomy um, is another is another strategy of how to do, of of how to help develop intrinsic motivation. So procedural could be okay. Here are here are four different prompts. You choose which one you want to respond to. The third way to encourage autonomy, which researchers have found, have been the primary way, the one that has developed the most intrinsic motivation is cognitive, um, uh, which is cognitive choice, um, which is, I mean, one way I do it is for reading strategies. So after we've learned a lot of different reading strategies, I tell students, okay, we use the reading strategy that you think in this text that would be most helpful to you. Or when we're exploring homework, challenging students to think, okay, what homework what homework site do you want to work on and what topic do you think you need to work on most? So that's the idea you know, of, of cognitive uh, choice, which works for developing autonomy. Competence is another way to help develop autonomy. I'm sorry, help develop interesting motivation. Do students feel like they are capable of doing what they are being asked to do? Uh, you know, there are lots of ways to help promote that. One is online practice, an online practice where students can make lots of mistakes and the only one who knows they're doing that is the computer. This idea of growth, of growth mindset. And it's important to differentiate when we talk about growth mindset. Growth mindset is not just praising effort, but it's also praising the strategies that students are using in their effort. Uh, and when we, we think about developing, uh, helping students develop a sense of confidence and competence, we want to remember that researchers have found that it takes, for every one critical interaction, students need to get three to five positive. So that, those are some ways to develop the sense of competence. The next one is relatedness. Is what the student is going is being asked to do, will that help him or her further develop a relationship with someone they like and or respect, which could be their classmates or their teacher? Uh, so for example, I'll specifically ask students to befriend and work with new students who have come into the class. Uh, and then teachers, the idea of just asking students about their lives, trying to find out what their goals are. Relevance. How does what we are learning connect to the students' goals, hopes, and dreams? Uh, and one student, one of my students wants to be a doctor, and every week she develops a, we develop a short plan of what is she going to do this week to help prepare her for that. Uh, another way researchers have found, if you just have students write, a couple of sentences after a lesson about how they think they can apply what they learned. So those, and there's lots of, again, on the blog, lots of online resources related to all practical ways to help develop intrinsic student motivation. Okay, so our third critical element, affirming error correction. I got the fun ones. Okay, that's right. Reading, <laughs> error correction. <laughs> so ELLs make a lot of mistakes, as Larry and I do, um, and as we speak Spanish and write in Spanish. 
And so the question is, how do we deal with these in an affirming way? Because we want our students to be able to take risks and see mistakes as opportunities to learn. And so one lesson that we do involves asking our students to make a list of English mistakes. It could be from the past couple of weeks or the past month. Um, these can be mistakes they've made when speaking or listening mistakes. They thought they heard something else or writing. And we have students write down the mistake and then also write down what they learned from the, that mistake. And so we compile a class list and students are able to see how much learning has occurred because of all of these mistakes that they have made. Uh, some other quick strategies, um, just if it's an error that or a mistake people are making but we've taught that already, uh, just pointing at the mistake. Usually students are able to fix it right then and there. Um, when students are working on a writing assignment, we usually just target one or two types of errors. And like Larry was talking about, online homework practice can be a great way for students to feel comfortable making mistakes because the only person who knows is them and the computer. Uh, probably our favorite strategy mm -hmm. for dealing with error correction is concept attainment. And we're going to just demonstrate really quickly. Let me see, can I borrow this from you? Uh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> so in concept attainment, we have a yes and a no column. And we have this up on the overhead. And so we will tell students, take a look, this is a yes. And it says, she has shoes. And here's a no. She have a small house. Okay, here's another yes. She has a black shirt. And here's another no. He have two cars. So we might ask students to pair up and talk quickly. What do they notice about the yeses? What, what might those be? What, why are they yeses and why are these noes? And we will continue doing examples and non-examples and having students generate the rule, has and have. Our students love doing this because it makes it like a puzzle. We love it because then they are inductively uh, constructing the concept that we want them to learn. And then another way that we uh, work with, deal with errors is through games to make it fun and engaging. Um, there's lots of ideas on on the blog for games, but one just quick one, we love the uh, whiteboards and students can work in a team or they can work by themselves and we will just put an, a sentence that has a mistake or mistakes in it and students have to write the correct version down and hold it up and winners. And if they don't, Larry says, you're losers. <laughs> It all relates to that, <laughs> the classroom culture. A little, yes. uh, I think yes. sar sarcasm, sarcasm has its place if students know that you truly care about them, as opposed to being weaponized. <laughs> and if you don't teach middle school. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's the end of our presentation. We're happy to answer questions, or we're also happy to end this session as well. So we have no we have no need to continue to hear ourselves speak at the end of a long teaching day, as <laughs> as, I'm, as you really? are probably also tired. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Okay. Well, thank you for joining us. Yes, thank you. And uh, 
Are, yeah. Oh, Jen wants to know, are these ideas posted yes. somewhere? Yes. Go to the blog. Go to Larry's blog. Yes. And the vast majority of these ideas you will see in the blog post once EduBlogs is back up and hopefully soon. So, great. Well, we, we wish you all a good rest of the school year, and uh, uh, we hope that these ideas have been helpful to you and your students. All right. Thank you very much.